Okay, thanks, uh, Shinkin and Cherry, for the great introduction, and thanks to all, everyone here, or everyone involved uh, in the organizing committee for inviting me to give the first talk, the inaugural one for the day. It's uh, scary. <laughs> Uh, so I will talk today about FRBs. I went for a flashy-ish title and then didn't follow through and just put black font on one slide. You know, title slide but that's okay. Uh, no real episode reference to the TV show. <laughs> and uh, so what I'll talk about today is first I'll introduce uh, FRBs, uh, kind of a uh, observational highlights of the history of FRB Scotland. I see a lot of young faces in the crowd, so even though it's a, so it's a short history, I uh, might not all have lived it. I, I, I didn't even know what they were doing. And then I'll dive into something that I've been involved in, which is the repeater. Uh, I noticed that three of our research highlights were related to the repeater uh, in uh, Shushin's introduction, so clearly it's uh, and you'll see it's the rich code, but it's only one source. Uh, and then I'll go into charm. Uh, I've been where something picking up more and more of my time, and a lot of time with people. <laughs> okay, so FRB astronomy started in 2007 when Duncan Norwer discovered this first a few milliseconds long. And the degree of the dispersion sweep that uh, is there shows that it propagated through a large amount of uh, plasma to predestine the source. Mm -hmm. And uh, the amount of that implies that it's come far from outside of our galaxy. Uh, and so it was thought to be extra galactic. And the, because it's uh, the redshift implied by it was you know, significant, it was. Called it cosmological work. Um, and uh, so, question right away was is it real? Is it? So, there was a lot of doubt that you could get something at cosmological distances, and so it was one of them. Uh, I remember around uh, when I started my PhD, Matthew Bales was visiting uh, McGill, and he Matthew Bales was, was, was working with Doug on this, and he was actually doubting that it could be real. And uh, I think that was because he knew about this, which was keraton. Uh, so this mythical creature was a keraton, and uh, the folks at Park, uh, led by Sarah, uh, put out this paper where they saw these bursts that looked like they followed approximately, but not exactly, one over s squared, like you'd expect from uh, interstellar dispersion. Uh, and it clustered, these events all clustered around the same dispersion measure as that of the Lorimer burst. And they were detected in all 13 beams of the park of the receiver, which means that the source has to come from the near field, but not uh, astrophysical. So because of that, there was a lot of doubt about the original uh, FRB detection. And so it was kind of a gray zone where were they FRB the thing or are they just uh, terrestrial interference or something coming from our atmosphere. But then a bit later, uh, we got this paper from Dan Gordon uh, and the parks. Yeah. <laughs> crew, uh, and they presented these four FRBs. They were clearly different than Caracol. They were not clustering on the same DM, uh, and they were bang on the dispersion relation we expect. They show scattering tails, some of them. Uh, this one is where it's most evident. Uh, and it's hard to get uh, that and dispersion from something that's not actually Unless uh, maybe you had someone sabotaging the uh, So, this was 
final visit time and FRB just visit and said, okay, they're a real thing, let's get into play. And then a little bit later, in the next couple of years, some other telescopes discovered from other than parks. So people could say, yes, they're not just coming from parks. Uh, it was still a doubter of the and all the results, and there were people, and frankly, that was important to uh, We found them at two more telescopes. One in the Piazza survey, we discovered FRB 1102, uh, and then at GBT uh, in a cosmology survey, Kilo, Masui, and all recorded uh, this. But importantly, this guy goes down to 700 megahertz. Previous to that, all FRBs were only at 1.4 gigahertz in our L band. So this is showing that it's a phenomenon that uh, goes down in frequency. Uh, another thing to say, which again is probably a trivial thing, uh, it shows a high degree of scattering and uh, measurable polarization uh, and a high rotation measure implying that it's coming from a dense magnetic. And then in 2016, the park folks reported that they had identified where paratons came from. So it was a good bookend to that uh, concern. And it was a microwave local to near the park telescope. We opened the door, uh, it let out radiation uh, that resembled uh, naturally the pulse. Then in 2016, we in the Pialpa survey discovered repeat bursts from FRB 121102. So this was a exciting moment. It showed that at least the subclass of the FRB phenomenon had to be able to repeat. It couldn't be a cataclysmic phenomenon where you destroy a star or you merge two chunks out together and then lose what causes the uh, event. And I'll talk more about the repeater later because that is going to be a, a focus point in my talk. Uh, and then last year, in the past couple of years, the more telescopes have joined the game. Uh, ASCAP operating in a fly by mode where they use each of their dishes independently pointing in the direction to get lots of sky coverage, reported uh, an FRB in 2017 and then 20 more uh, earlier this year. Uh, and Atmos, which is a cylindrical telescope, just one arm going east to west right now, uh, has joined the game and is reporting FRB detection. Uh, yeah, and the, the number of FRBs, if you haven't noticed, if you can count the uh, on the side of the slide there, is increasing. And now, just in a, about you know, the past year, uh, so ASCAP has reported their 20 FRB, so we're up to 60 ish, 60 or 70 uh, FRBs. And then Chime has come online this year and started finding FRBs. We reported it in HL, our first detection, and we said that there are more. And uh, so this is a plot. Yeah, so this is uh, my very you know, <coughs> timeline of observational uh, highlights. Uh, mostly, you know, not really, uh, mostly focused on just creating the uh, uh, skimming the just the highlights of when telescopes join the game and a couple of important results. Uh, <coughs> So you'll notice it was since until 2013 that we really, you know, were convincing things are real. That's about half the time. So half of FRB is gone because we've been doubting the phenomenon didn't exist. And we're in a time of transition now. We're going from uh, you know a dozen events in 2014-15 to potentially hundreds very soon. And the number of people searching for FRBs is also growing. So, what do we know from 
this past 10 years. Uh, so very the simple things are, yes, FRBs are real. They, they're short events. They look like they're extragalactic. So that implies they have very high luminosities. And so there must be a very energetic phenomenon from a small region. This leads a lot of people towards compact objects like neutron stars, black holes, uh, and there are other exotic theories as well. Uh, we know from the repeater that FRBs can repeat and that it emits at a large range of frequencies. There's a, other things not listed on this slide uh, that uh, it looks like the population is isotropic and distributed at least close to Euclidean. More FRBs would get the closer to the Euclidean uh, it gets, so it would be distributed in 3D space. Uh, uh, yeah. And, um, yeah, and the rates that we have for FRBs are quite high. They're consistent with uh, other astrophysical, a lot of astrophysical classes like uh, supernova rays and neutron filaments. So, uh, Yeah. We're not sure whether or not this one. And so I'm going to focus now on two things. So one, the repeater, and then two on time. So let's dive into the repeater. So in 2000, in November 2015, we discovered 10 additional bursts from the repeater. Um, and yeah, here they are. It was the immediate implication was that it comes from a non cataclysmic phenomenon, something that has to repeat. And there were a couple of observational things that we noted pretty quickly that we thought, wow, that's weird. Uh, one is these bursts did not come uh, in a random Poissonian uh, uh, fashion, they came in clumps. So the first, the first. So the first one came in 2012, that's why it's FRB 1211 or two. And then the next four kind of came in as smattering of a couple of uh, half hour observations within a couple of weeks of each other. And then this last one, uh, the last six all came within the 20 minute period. So it was obvious right away that it's a very uh, uh, non-Pressonian process going on where you have uh, pumps and birds coming in episodes. Um, and another thing is we noted that the spectra were not broadband, so or not uh, not described well by a single power law spectrum. So you see some birds, so these sun panels are the spectrum sun along the, at the time of the burst. You see some that are rising towards higher frequency, some that are uh, rising towards lower frequency and some that are peaked in the middle. Uh, and so we were yeah, kind of shocked by these two things that we weren't expecting. Uh, so to reinforce the non Poissonian nature, as we observe more and more of these, or we observe the repeater for longer and longer, uh, we did, so on this plot, we had the rate against uh, Time and we did many dozens of now probably hundreds of hours of observations of the repeater in the Nish radio telescope. And we saw many observations where we see nothing. So the rate is zero in those observations. And then we get lucky sometimes and we can get like 10 births an hour and we get something like a dozen births in the observation. Uh, and we got really lucky in September 2016. And Use those recent bursts to localize uh, the uh, repeater. To spoil a couple of slides. Uh, <clears throat> and as we look closer at the burst, they just got weirder. Uh, so when we we use the coherent dispersion to be able to better resolve the pulse, uh, so our our, our original detections are more channelized we, uh, we did because we're incoherent, we use dispersing. Uh, and so we can't resolve the structure, but once we do the dispersion measure, we can correct for it. 
once we need the dispersion measure of the uh, the repeater, we can we could uh, correct for the dispersion suit before channelizing data, and then you're able to reconstruct the pulse by better time resolution, time frequency resolution. <coughs> then you could with incoherence dispersion where you channelize the uh, data before you correct for the dispersion suit. And so, uh, yeah, and so we see kind of universally in the, the repeater, which eventually I'll have stuff in the repeater one day, hopefully. Uh, uh, we universally see at FRB 121102 that the structure, we have these structures that march down the frequency. Uh, and <laughs> so that's a result that we recently explored in, uh, in a paper recently submitted and posted on the archive by Jason Sutton. Okay, about a week ago. And then in, <coughs> uh, I think it was fall 2016, we caught a burst using the Gen VLA and were able to use that burst to localize the location of. Uh, FRB 1202, we localized it to a uh, first in the VLA image, it was co located with a bright, uh, rate, persistent radio source, and then in optical follow up. So, in our, in our archival uh, optical images, we didn't really see much, maybe there was a little hint of a smudge there, and then with Gemini and HSP. Uh, observation we got, uh, uh, we were able to resolve the dwarf galaxy there with a little knot, uh, optical knot that uh, the repeater lives in. Um, and we also followed up using uh, x ray and saw nothing, a couple of photons there, but this is in the background. You can give them names if you want. The nice thing about x ray is you can name your images. Yeah, so this was the this was the the first and today only uh, post galaxy identification for FRB. It was enabled by the replication. In fact, that we could see, we could predict a lot of things. We knew that the the uh, that the source would burst eventually, so we could point uh, our telescopes to that location and wait for the burst in the interferometer like the LA and say, hey. That's the reverse uh, And the redshift was about 0.19. It implied that about half of the dispersion measure excess that we get from the, 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 from what's in our, our galaxy is, uh, is from the IGM and about half is in the host. So the host does provide a significant amount of. Uh, the dispersion vision. This has implications if you, if for other FRBs, if you we say that the maximum the, the distance we get implied from the dispersion measure is the maximum limit because we don't know how much comes from the host. And at least in this source, we see that a significant amount does. Uh, we also the repeating nature also enabled us to go after with uh, in other wavelengths. Um, so I did a campaign with Chandra XMM joined with, uh, well, every radio telescope that's get my hands on, we get our hands on. So Eris GT, Eppelberg, uh, all observing at some point uh, simultaneously with Chandra and XMM so that when you get a radio burst, you can say, is there any X ray imaging around the time of that radio burst? Letting you place the best uh, limits or having the best chance of detection uh, because you have a relatively small amount of time to, to look in for uh, X ray imaging. And so we did that for using 12 radio bursts that occurred uh, during the simultaneous observations, didn't detect anything above the background. And so we placed limits, similar exercise we've done 
using uh, the 2.4 meter high national telescope, uh, which did have an instrument that they could do images at, uh, I think, uh, 70 milliseconds. Uh, so most of the time, the optical you have to take like several second long exposure. And so using that, they placed limits uh, on the optical and on the optical imaging. That's um, 13 meters. Uh, so for the for the long time with the repeater, uh, we were not able to detect any polarization. This turned out was because we were observing at uh, L band and S band, so that's at one gigahertz or two gigahertz. Um, and if you have a large amount of Faraday location caused by the magnetic field uh, between us and the source, uh, when it's hot enough, that will smear out your polarized signal within a single frequency channel, and then you depolarize the detected emission. Uh, that's called bandwidth depolarization. That happens uh, <coughs> because of your detector. And so it turned out when we looked at higher frequencies, so between four and eight gigahertz, we got about a 100% polarized signal. And uh, that implied, and well, from that, the polarized emission, we measured the Faraday rotation, uh, the rotation measure, and it was 100,000. Now, that number might not mean something to everyone. But let's compare compared to other pulsars in our galaxy. Uh, most of them are less than a thousand, so that implies that they pass through a lot of magnetized uh, plasma that uh, rotates the polarization, perhaps the polarization vector uh, <clears throat> as a function of frequency due to Faraday. And the only other source that does this that we know that quite quite that much. Is actually the galactic center magnet of USRG 1745, uh, which lives uh, on the galactic center magnet of so at our galactic center. Uh, in our galactic center, it has a lot of uh, the dense region with a lot of magnetized plasma. And so that uh, has observational implications that uh, FRB 1202 has to live in a similar environment. Maybe not as far as that it could be a nebula that was associated as associated with say the birth of the object uh, with uh, oh no, not yet. So to summarize what I said in these last slides, what do we know about the, from the repeater? First, we know our we can repeat. Uh, so it has to be a non-catastrophic phenomenon causing this. Second, uh, the host is the the host is a dwarf galaxy at uh, 0.9. Uh, I think uh, then we'll probably go more into this, I'm sure. Uh, but that type of dwarf galaxy, low metallicity dwarf galaxy, is similar to uh, similar to the host of magnetar forming spoons uh, and all the RV. So these kinds of supernova that are thought to perhaps form magnetar. Uh, and so, and uh, it's co located with a bright radio point source of unknown origin. Uh, it could be uh, a central black hole in that galaxy, although offset, I guess, for example, because we saw the image was bright. The, the location was not. And, uh, or it could be something associated with. Uh, that can young supernova that uh, form the FLB or the FLB source magnetar or uh, magnetar wind nebula. Uh, it's 100% polarized with the Faraday rotation. As I said, that implies it lives in the dense magnetar plasma. And uh, it has these weird structures that uh, from a 10 to 100 megahertz wide. And they show the substructure that marches down in two. So, all these facts led to at least have directed some thinking within the community towards 
a young magnetar uh, uh, that formed in a, you know, in a, in a super luminous supernova or a long PRV type event that, uh, that is preferred in this type of galaxy, that prefers this type of galaxy. And the bright persistent source is maybe a galactic central black hole, and then that would be an analogy to the galactic central magnetar. Or the bright persistent radio source could be related to the formation of the uh, of the magnetar. And so, I thought I would do a little exercise. Is we know these things about the repeater, and but are they? Are, is there any evidence that they are useful for the rest of the population? The repeater is. One source that repeats the rest of all the has no repeaters detected from them. So, is there any evidence that any of these are <coughs> true? So, FRB repeat. Uh, other uh, other FRBs have been followed up quite a bit to find repeats, especially after we found that one repeated. Uh, so, parts have spent you know, hundreds of hours following up on. A good fraction of their discovered FRBs and seeing nothing. Admittedly, parts is less sensitive than the telescope we discovered uh, FRB 12102 with, uh, Arecibo, but uh, that's a lot of time. <laughs> Ask uh, because in their fly cycle, they have so much field of view, <coughs> they kind of automatically in their survey got days of infiltration time on. Or 20 of the FRBs. Again, they are much less sensitive than their SIBO, but they're spending a lot of time following up. And uh, perhaps more powerfully, though early, uh, with Chime, we see the same locations, we see the same location the sky daily. And, uh, and so we have FRBs that pass through daily, and if they all repeat with, with as much uh, gusto as uh, FRB 12102, we would expect to get a large fraction of repeat uh, eventually with child. Uh, so I think, based on the evidence, if all FRBs repeat, they're not as uh, uh, enthusiastic as uh, FRB 12102. But it's important to note that just because you don't detect repeats doesn't mean it can't. So the rarity of repeaters could be one of two things. It could be we have one population and the repeater and any future repeaters would belong to a some population that for some reason uh, is detectable. Maybe it lives on the tail of uh, some parameter of repeatedness, uh, you know, repeat, uh, repeatedness distribution, uh, where we have a chance of, we have a good enough chance to detect it, but the rest of the population repeats at a rate, say, you know, we're able to get an episode from them or a burst once per 10 years with the telescope we have now once per 100 years. If it was you know, once per a million years, then you wonder why the repeater is so special. But uh, it's possible we live in some sort of universe like this. Uh, and then the other uh, thing would be that we have multiple populations. We have a repeatable population where, like uh, FRB 12102, caused by something that doesn't destroy itself when you when it gives off a burst, and then another population that is captured. And then, so the other one, or another, another fact about the repeater is that it shows the spectral structure. Do we see the spectral, the spectral features that we see in the repeater in other FRBs? So other FRBs seem to also show where they peak in the band, so they have you know tens to hundreds of megahertz wide uh, 
spectra uh, in, in your radio band. But we haven't seen uh, an instance of the marching down uh, structure that we see in the repeater in, uh, in all these, in all the other one off events for me. Uh, and then I show some examples here. Some of them have been done with incoherent Venus version. And you see quite a bit of structure in there, but it's not quite reminiscent of uh, what you see in the repeater. Um, it's important to say, so I mentioned coherent versus incoherent Venus version. You need to know the dispersion measure beforehand in order to do coherent Venus version. So uh, it's hard to do with one off sources unless you dump your baseband. Data, get your um, get your uh, dispersion measure and then reprocess it, which is what these guys did. And in our case, we did it with three feet first, so we can preserve it for three feet first. Um, <clears throat> but the majority of FRBs have not not been able, <laughs> able to get this high frequency resolution by building these version, and so it's possible that the that this marching down subject could be hiding in another spectrum, and we just not able to resolve it. But we do have counterexamples that don't show that behavior. So, do all FRBs live in highly magnetized environments? So, we don't have too many. We have a handful of FRBs that have polarization detected. Uh, <clears throat> Four have rotation measures uh, consistent with zero or the Milky Way, and find that didn't propagate through enough plasma to significantly uh, rotate your polarization vector as you expect very rotation. Um, and uh, three, including FRB 12102, have um, measured excess rotation measures. In excess from what you would expect provided from our galaxy. And they are the two other than FRB 12102 are not as extreme as the repeater. So, and then one shows zero polarization. But of course, if you detect zero polarization at L band or at lower frequency, it's possible it's like the repeater and you have a polarized system which is. Depolarized through the family of depolarization. So there could be uh, it could be a highly uh, polarized population hiding in the existing uh, FRB detection. Yeah, so we have a mixed bag here for uh, rotation measure and polarization. It's not a we don't have a uniform uh, uniform observation of property. Uh, and then do all FRBs live in dwarf galaxies? Well, that's a really hard question to answer because without arc second fish localization, you are going to have a very high chance of having a dwarf galaxy in your uh, radio beam. Uh, dwarf galaxies are much more numerous than brighter galaxies. And so in any given location, uh, you have a high chance of seeing uh, of having a dwarf galaxy in your region. Here's some examples of uh, of localized FRBs, uh, not localized, but of FRBs detected at parks. One there just shows the shows the the region that they <coughs> the region that their radio beam uh, covers, and you can see there are many optical sources in there. Uh, a lot brighter than any dwarf galaxy. Very familiar with the dwarf galaxy. Uh, and then, even when you get uh, more refined localization using, uh, for example, using multiple detection information, uh, you still have many galaxies in there. They've marked a few, and those galaxies are all quite bright because of the shallow image. Um, uh, and so, the chances of, without our second localization, Seeing, uh, be able to tell whether or not there's a dwarf galaxy consistent with your FRB is uh, hard. 
there will be one in 15 years. Unless to rule it out. Okay, so I, I flip it around and say, what's not universally true? So we had some counterexamples to the main kinds of environment. So uh, not all FRBs have that same evidence of uh, how the main kinds environments close to them, like the repeater. Uh, so maybe that's unique to that source, or and maybe it's important to a repeater subclass, or maybe not. And then the marching down subject that we had counted down to be. But all of the rest could still be true. All FRBs could repeat. Uh, all FRBs could come from those galaxies. Uh, I think you can say that all FRBs could have these uh, uh, non power law. So, uh, from that experience with the repeater, what did uh, we learn? Or I learned from uh, some of this, you know, quite a bit obvious going in, but lesson. So, uh, <clears throat> localization was extremely important. Uh, it, it helped us ID the host galaxy and associated radio stores. It allowed us to search for multi wavelength counterparts. Without localization, you can point your telescope there, you're going to see stuff. It's going to be consistent with. Uh, background and uh, you need that localization in order to get your uh, in order to get a good memory. Um, also maybe not obvious the detection of uh, of the polarization is also enabled by localization. You don't need arc second uh, resolution in order to do that but your beam at higher frequency is much smaller than a lower frequency would have been a much more expensive exercise to try to detect FRB 12102 at high <coughs> frequency without the localization because you have to rig your smaller beam on your large uh, uncertainty. Um, so the localization was extremely important to those two repeaters. Uh, and it was possible because of its repeating nature. Uh, it's much harder with one off sources to localize because you have to do it. When uh, another thing is that interesting wavelength, multi wavelength limits are hard. So, in the Magnetar uh, theory, or uh, you might say that the, that the FRBs could come from something like uh, Magnetar activity seen in our galaxy. Uh, and the brightest thing that a magnetar has done in that galaxy is a giant flare of SPR 1806. Uh, we put a limit here by stacking the location of 12, stacking the limits we got from, in, from 12, uh, 12 radio bursts uh, at the time of our X ray observation. And this is using like the best radio or X ray telescopes we have, Chandra and XMM. And we're still in order of magnitude off where you would expect to see the brightest magnetar giant flare in our galaxy. True that this, uh, um, <clears throat> if, 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 if the source is a young magnetar, it could be more extreme than ours, so we might expect to see something, but to totally rule out something like that, you need much better limits. And it's not actually as bad as our layout there. Uh, certainly for a repeatable phenomenon, because the source is repeating, you have a lot less of the energy reservoir to provide uh, emission in other wavelengths. Uh, so yes, you can do dedicated deep observation stack your limits at the time of <coughs> yeah, stack multiple protection of radio emission to put a good limit on uh, simultaneous emission. But on the other hand, you have less energy available for uh, multi wavelength emission. Uh, whereas with the cataclysmic phenomenon, if you're exploding a star, shallow order observations might still be okay because you have much more energy available from uh, your event potentially. Uh, and another uh, pessimistic point, I don't mean to be too pessimistic, is that we spent a lot of time uh, on the repeater 
We spent hundreds of hours with a single inch radio telescope. The localization for dozens of hours uh, with VLA, most of it seeing nothing and getting very discouraged. Uh, and in order, in order to buy the host galaxy, we spent uh, a lot of optical telescope time and place of limits. We spent a lot of uh, X ray telescope and optical telescope time. So the follow up is very expensive. In the era where we potentially have, say, I don't know, uh, hundreds of thousands of FRBs, say even 1% of them are repeaters, and we want to do this type of follow up. Uh, that's so it's there are people aren't going to do that. But uh, so I uh, to end my repeater discussion on a more optimistic note, the number one lesson I think is expect the unexpected. We went out when we were detecting the when we uh, were we observed the location of the repeater to put by the sound of repeatability. And then all of a sudden we have this uh, you know exquisite moment where it's like oh my goodness I found repeats and uh, you know and then uh, when we dug into the source we started by trying to fit a power law index to our to our spectra it didn't fit at all we still reported those spectral indices in our first paper because that's what you do uh, and then. <clears throat> we uh, we localized to an arc second thinking, oh, there's going to be a nice you know galaxy there. And then we looked in the archival images and oh, I guess there's something there. The yeah, FRBs be from you know empty space. <laughs> but then of course we were deeper and so we could look out. And then we had for a while we had no evidence for any polarization. Uh, and then what we finally did get for it is another insane property. Which was uh, <coughs> how to be a Faraday location. So, you know, what, what's next? Uh, hopefully, something we haven't thought of before, at least with a naive respect. <laughs> okay, so a common refrain in FRB astronomy has been there are more theories for FRBs than events. Well, I think, or something to that effect. You hear people say it. So, but I think we can safely say that soon we're going to be transitioning to another regime. I don't want to, you know, here's a very creative, so <laughs> it might take longer than I think, but eventually we're going to get there. And I think now is the time that we're going to be crossing that point. And the reason mostly is time. So time sits in uh, BC. At uh, DRIO in Edmonton, it's four cylinders, 20 meters wide, and 100 meters long. And because of this cylindrical shape, it sees a huge horizon to horizon strip on the sky, which we uh, record beams on that uh, 1024 beams along that strip and search them all for FRBs. So it's a 100 meter ish telescope with a huge field view. That leads to a lot of FRBs. Um, and so here's a plot from our uh, from our paper that uh, our instrument description paper. Uh, <coughs> and uh, you can see that the, so before turning on time, this is kind of our best uh, expectation of what we might see. So there were non-detections at low frequency detections at the top of our band at 800 megahertz. And so as a function of frequency, our uncertainty kind of increases to what we might see. Uh, or, or, yeah. And so the rates that we're thinking that we were thinking before turning on was uh, potentially up to uh, dozens per day um, as on the lower end uh, Several, but not one day. And uh, it's important to say at the beginning, we knew there were FRBs at the top of our band, but there's no evidence that they go down below 800 megahertz. And there are reasons that you might not expect them to be in our band. Uh, one, they could be scattered out. So, as uh, 
That's very interesting to propagate through uh in Chalamet and they get scattered by homogeneities uh, uh in the interstellar and interstellar medium in our galaxy as well as in the host galaxy. And so that could smear up pulses. Also, uh you could expect uh free free absorption if you have a lot of uh material close to the source that absorbs it. Absorbs the radiation at low frequency, you can't get uh, low frequency uh, radio emission out. Uh, but we turned on, we looked, we found the FRBs go right to the bottom of our band, and they are you know, fairly bright down there. So we had the, we're very excited to see this. This means that the great uh, expectations are. Hmm. They're not going to be significantly hampered by effects like absorption and scattering, so we're going to detect lots of FRB. Okay. Uh, but the amount of scattering that we do see in our sample, so well, you know, this is an embargo result, a uh, paper that we submitted about a week ago for Nature, and it's Nature, so don't talk to the press about this result, uh, don't tweet it. No. You guys like to tweet. <laughs> and uh, anyways, the amount of scattering that we see in these uh, show that they are in environments that have more scattering than you would expect from uh, well, from Fabrice or our Milky Way, plus uh, if it was just a random uh, orientation within the host galaxy. Uh, you just take a random sight line and say going through. The host galaxy, you don't expect to see this much scattering statistically in a sample. And so that shows that there is some evidence of uh, extra scattering present in the host, of course, uh, but not too much that uh, everything's moved up. Okay, so it's important to say that these results are from our pre commissioning, which was defined as less beams on the sky and we're updating the system. Continuously, effectively, the way we were putting our beams on the sky, we basically had one row of beams instead of four. So the coverage uh, was less than we do in a full uh, operation. And we are still now commissioning. We are we are updating our system periodically. We don't have a single uh, configuration, consistent configuration. So we're not quite in full science. Operation yet, but we are still discovering many FRBs. Uh, so, what, what will we learn from Chime? So, we have FRBs now. Uh, we should get a good handle on the sky distribution. Uh, is there a little bit of a hint that there was a galactic plane avoidance uh, pan out, that type of thing? Um, a distribution of Properties of anything you could measure from FRBs, EMs with uh, rotation measures, scattering time scale, which will tell us uh, things about the FRB, typical things about the FRB population, what kind of environments they live in from rotation measures and scattering. Uh, <clears throat> um, and also, within those properties, there might be evidence for multiple populations. And we will very quickly understand. Uh, how much of the population is repeating because we have this daily, every time, every day we get at least 10 to 20 minutes on the solar system as it passes over the time gap. And so we will get very good uh, limits on repeatability from uh, FRB. There's much more to come from China. Yeah, so I'm going to predict where we'll be observationally with FRBs in a year. It's a scary thing to do because I'll probably be wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, so, in a year, we'll have hundreds of FRBs. We have dozens now, we'll have hundreds. Uh, hopefully, by then, we'll have more FRBs. Uh, we will have an idea of what fraction of the population repeats, um, at least to a detectable level with. Uh, our observing cadence and sensitivity and all that. We'll probably have, if we have a handful of repeaters, we'll probably be able to get a bunch of telescope time on interferometers to localize through from within a year. 
um, that will be very helpful to tell us whether the Peter is unique or not. Whether the fact that it's in the dwarf galaxy is important to this class or whether it would uh, protect the setup. And we'll probably have polarization on a good sample of events, so we'll be able to say things about the uh, events. How much of the population would like to be really high in thinking? Uh, that will require some follow up as well as we be in order to see that I would think that would be polarized uh, in our band. Yeah. Uh, so, those are all exciting things. I'm also making perhaps pessimistic predictions. I don't think we'll have an annual localization one off the bat. We might. There are initiatives going on. and. Uh, uh, ASCAP will be pointing your telescopes instead of the fly by going everywhere in the sky. We'll be pointing uh, to a single location in that interferometric as long as that baseline is get mark second resolution. So it's possible they get that in a year. Uh, okay. Um, and we'll also want to do lots of follow up on discovered FRDs, but we'll be limited by the amount of telescope time. Yeah, so time will answer a lot of questions. You should have commonly to end your FRB paper with China is the future at the end of it. And you know, to some extent it is. We are going to explode the FRB population. We're going to find things that we didn't expect. We're going to answer questions that we did expect to answer. And uh, but it's not the end of FRB science. It's not like, okay, we can pack up and go home now. We've answered that in the chat. In order to figure out what FRBs are, as well as keeping them both uh, <coughs> extra and cosmological probes, you need localization uh, and uh, being able to detect a multi wavelength habitat would help a lot uh, in determining what source is. Uh, so, for localization, uh, there are future initiatives going on. Uh, I mentioned uh, ASCAP will be using um, themselves. More as an interferometer and searching while they're for FLBs while they're observing, so they could potentially get an arc second level localization. Uh, in Australia, the Morongo telescope will be putting little outriggers on the north south arm uh, in order to get uh, localization, uh, arc second level localization in two dimensions instead of just one in the east west west arm. Uh, deep synoptic array will. In the next few years, we'll be upgrading to I think 110 dishes. So they have small dishes uh, in Bowen Valley, California, and um, they will be uh, you know, searching for FRBs with uh, long baselines in order to get uh, arc second localization. And then, as well, in time, we're talking about putting things far away um, to uh, localize. The FRBs that we detect to uh, our second uh, Another future direction to go is also the other frequency. So we know now that FRBs are at the bottom of our, of our band, but how much further do they go down? We know that they're not so uh, numerous that uh, they're detected by other surveys, such as at Green Bank and LOFAR and NWA. Uh, and so it's not like there's a huge effort. Huge population down there. Uh, it's not like the population explodes if you go to low frequency, but it's clear that it's still there from China. And so, how far down does it go? Do we ever get uh, any absorption that prevents the emission from getting out of low frequency? That'll tell us something about the source. Uh, so, uh, to conclude, uh, we know things about FRBs, but mostly we need a lot to find out. Uh, the repeater seems unique in many ways, but uh, you know, as I said, uh, there are a few observational things that we can't extend to the rest of the FRB population, and uh, there's evidence that the repeater is a little bit uh, unique. Uh, it is hints that it comes from uh, a subpopulation, either in source or in repeat repeatability. Uh, but 
with charm. You will learn very quickly how unique it is. And, uh, and that's evidence from the repeater and, you know, charming in general. Uh, the field of GRB is like to just do localization and all the way to like uh, counterparts are huge for figuring out how to start it. So thanks. Uh, expect the I expect. Thank you, Paul, for our amazing talk. I think we have time for some questions. Well, everybody understood everything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Brian. Uh, just for completeness, I want to note that uh, the MEPAT um, has this project, MEATRAP, uh, they should be getting maybe one uh, second localization month, or so they get within a year. Uh, probably, yeah, possibly. Mm -hmm. so I hope that you could be wrong, especially when it has a few things. Yeah. Are you able to get the That um, there is a strong selection effect against seeing highly scattered <coughs> events because they get smeared, you smear the power over a lot of time. So, the, I mean, this is just a generic thing to all telescopes that um, tend to see the least scattered ones, but the highly scattered ones that get diluted by scattering time. So, the, the thing that I'm actually curious about is given that that <coughs> is the case, uh, that's obviously the case in hindsight. Perhaps even in the part span, there could be many more highly scattered events that, for the same reason, just don't make the cut anymore. And perhaps another argument is perhaps if get higher frequencies, then the event rate may actually be higher than extrapolated by any of these, um, since there's such a strong selection against seeing scattered bursts. Does the scattering correlate with dispersion? Do you guys see that? Uh, don't think. Yeah, I don't think we see that. We have, to, we have a smaller sample in that sequence. We will have a larger sample in the future that actually probes better. Any more questions? Thank you. All right, if not, then let's thank you all again.